Good morning, Grace. I want to welcome you guys here once again. My name is Clay. I'm also one of the pastors here, alongside with Mark, who is obviously doing the baby dedication. And today you guys get two sermons for the price of one. I know you paid a lot of money to get in here. The tickets were very expensive, but if you're not satisfied, we'll be totally happy to refund your money. Um, One of the things we love doing as a church is we love going through books of the Bible, and we do this because we believe the, the Bible is God's word to us, and not because it's just a list of rules telling us what we have to do, but because it reveals to us the story of who Jesus is, what he's done, and how he came to rescue lost sinners who openly rebelled against him, but now he wants to rescue us out of the slavery we put ourselves into. And we want to get to know this Jesus better. And so just like we want to be reading through the scriptures throughout the course of the year, and this is why we have ourselves on this Bible plan that we've been going through with Read Scripture. That's why we're playing the videos. And we want to make sure that we get to know what the scriptures are all about. And one of the ways we do that is we take books of the Bible where we slowly go through each book, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, we want to read it in context to get to understand who Jesus says he is, who the people who knew him best said Jesus is, and how this all relates to us. What does it mean? And how do our lives change because of it? So we took a break last week for Easter. We were in 1 Corinthians 15. And now this week, we're back again in John chapter 7. A couple of weeks ago, Scott took us from verse 1 to 10. So today we're going to be focusing on verse 11 all the way to 24 today. So if you want to turn in your Bible to John 7, we're going to be in verse 11 to 24. If you want to do that in your book form or app form, totally acceptable. The Wi-Fi in here is terrible, so if you have an internet connection, that's awesome. If you don't have a Bible, if you actually don't even own one at all, there are some over by the giving box back there. You can just take that home with you. We want you to be able to read through the Bible yourself, get to know Jesus, get to know what does the Bible say about Jesus. Don't just take my word for it, but look and see what does it say for itself. And if you just forgot yours, you're welcome to borrow one as well if you prefer a paper copy. So before we dig into the scripture together, we're going to have it read on the screen behind me, but I want to pray and just ask that God would be here with us. Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you that you've given us the scriptures, that we can hear about Jesus. We can see this story of God and how you have come to rescue sinners like us. I thank you that even though we've run away in rebellion, that you've provided a way to be brought right into a relationship with you, Jesus. I pray this morning as we read through John 7, as we're going through verse 11 to 24, that you would speak to us, that we would see what you want us to see, that you would open our eyes and our hearts to the reality of not only what you've done, but now what life looks like because of that. I thank you for giving us these things we can dwell on. I pray that we would actually do that. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So let's watch the scripture video as it's played on the screen behind me. Reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 7, verses 11 through 24. The Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, Where is he? And there was much muttering about him among the people, while some said, He is a good man. Others said, No, he is leading the people astray. Yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, How is it that this man is learning when he has never studied? So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answered, You have a demon who is seeking to kill you. Jesus answered them, I did one work and you all marveled at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath, a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath, I made a man's whole body well? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. So this section is going to be talking about judgment. And one of the things you might have noticed about the culture we live in is people love to judge. 
It's just what we do. People love to make judgments. But at the same time, if you were to ask anyone that in this culture we live in, what is the worst thing you can do to anyone else? A lot of people would answer, well, the worst thing is to judge someone. Like, that's just despicable. That's the absolute bottom of the barrel. Now, this is really hard to reconcile because... In this pluralistic society we live in, everyone seems to deem that anything you want to believe is permissible. And in fact, we celebrate the diversity of ideas in our society. And yet, we judge people for judging. I know that sounds like a contradiction because it actually is, because we fail to recognize that the very act of telling someone you can't judge is an act of judgment. And yet, even if you were to bring that up, you're called narrow-minded, you're called judgmental yourself. And the sad thing is that even a lot of Christians can get wound up in this anti-judgmentalism way of thinking. People love to quote the first part of Matthew 7, in chapter, or in chapter 7, verse 1. Christians love to quote this. And, and even a lot of non-Christians know this verse off by heart because they've heard it before and they're like, yeah, I like the sound of that. It says, judge not that you be not judged. Or if you've heard it in the old King James, it is judge not lest ye be judged. And people will say this, but they have no idea what it means. They have no idea of the context Jesus was speaking and how this relates to what Jesus was trying to to come across saying. But we say it because we like how it sounds. And even I hear a lot of Christians, they'll, they'll come up with other phrases that say things like, well, don't judge someone because they sin differently than you do. I can kind of understand this, the sentiment behind what they're trying to say. And the best case, they're trying to fight against people judging wrongly. They want to have compassion on those whose struggles are different than their own. And they want to make sure that they seem welcoming and inviting to all, that we, we're acknowledging that we're all sinners, that Christians aren't saved because we do more good work so that we're better people. And, and those things are all true and good. But I think a lot of times these kinds of statements and this kind of thinking can be used as an excuse to ignore God's call for holiness and ignore what Jesus has actually called us to do. And so we end up labeling those who desire to follow follow Jesus, those who desire to live holy and upright lives as Pharisees or legalists. And all of a sudden, even within the Christian bubble we can sometimes find ourselves in, there's a lot of judging going on for the fact that people are trying to live according to what God has said we should. The biggest problem is that we can't escape judgment. As people, we just, we judge. And it's not necessarily a good or bad thing because everyone has thoughts, everyone has opinions, everyone comes to conclusions. Those are all forms of judgment. They're all forms of the ways in which we think. And we're going to see right away in verses 11 and 12 in John 7 here that it's not anything new. This has been happening from the very beginning. We all come up with ideas But these people here, they are coming up with their opinions and their judgments about Jesus. So let's see what it says. Verse 11, the Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, where is he? And there was much muttering about him among the people. While some said he's a good man, others said, no, he's leading people astray. So this is what happens when people gather together. They start sharing their thoughts and opinions. And in this case, they're muttering. They're muttering about Jesus. Now, this word muttering elsewhere is translated in the Bible as murmuring or grumbling or complaining. So even though we saw one guy said he's a good man, there's other people and seems most of the people were disproving or disapproving of what Jesus was doing. They didn't like it. They didn't like what he was doing. They didn't like what he was saying. And they said he was a false teacher. He's leading people astray. This was their judgment towards Jesus. Now, as an aside, I think we need to maybe take a step back and think, is this what happens when we gather with people? And oftentimes it's really easy when groups of people gather together, when friends get together, the first thing we do is complain about something. We'll say, hey, how's it going? And at best, it's like people say, well, I can't complain, as if that's a problem. It's like, well, I really want to talk about something, but I have nothing bad, so I can't complain. You know, what's the use of this conversation? But it's it's really natural for us to gang up on people and situations, and we like complaining. It's unfortunately a a natural state we're in that is not a good thing. And whether it's about the disapproval of our government or the church or friends or neighbors or people we know, we love to complain. 
We love to murmur. It's something we gravitate towards. But why do we do that? Why, why is this our natural bent? If we go back to the text, we see that even though some said he's a good man, really, it seems the majority are, are saying he's leading people astray. Because they've, they've all formed this opinion. They've all got a judgment. And I want to see at the end of where we're going to be going today, in verse 24, this is what Jesus says about these judgments, these thoughts. He says, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. So Jesus wants us to know that there is a right way and a wrong way to judge. It's not simply evil to judge. It's not that we shouldn't judge. It's how do we judge? Why do we judge? What's our motives behind these things? There's a right way and a wrong way, a way that's righteous and a way that's not righteous. To judge unrighteously is to judge by appearances only or, or inaccuracies. Now, I really love how the way the author John weaves this together for us, the way he tells this story, he allows us to see the different ways people were judging and how they were coming up with these judgments, and he can show us what are some right ways and what are some wrong ways to judge. So let's look at verse 13 to see how this all transpires. Verse 13, it says, Yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. So in verse 12, we saw that there were people that thought Jesus was a good man, But when it came to actually talking about him openly or in public, these people would say nothing good about Jesus. When it came to their public judgment, it was not based on what was true or not. It was based on public opinion. It was based on what the crowd thought. So we can see right away that a bad way to judge is based on fear of what other people think or out of fear of what the crowd around us is doing, because we want to fit in. Now, so many of them were going along with the crowd, and obviously that's the easy thing to do. I mean, everyone's going a certain way. It's like, well, I don't want to look like a weirdo. I'm just going to fit in, and and I'm going to do things the way everyone else is doing it. And really, who wants to do the hard work of coming to their own conclusions? I mean, you actually have to think about things. You have to wrestle. You have to weigh the consequences. You have to wrap your mind around something, and... In the age we live in, people love to just, I'm going to be an individual, but I'm going to follow the crowd. That's kind of the mantra we we live in right now. And in this instance, it's like the leaders are saying that Jesus is a bad guy. So who am I to argue? They must know what they're talking about, right? Now, this is what happens when we base our approval based on human approval rather than God's approval. So Jesus had continued to show them, and we've seen this throughout the entire Gospel of John, that he really was sent by God. The Father had sent them, and it was the Father who approved of Jesus and what he was doing. Now, how many times in a day do we actually inform ourselves of the thoughts and opinions that we are generating based on human authority versus based on God's authority? Are we thinking, would God approve of this, or is this just approved based on what others think? In the Gospel according to Luke, we read Jesus telling his disciples that we should not fear man. Rather, we should fear God. So this is what he says in Luke 12, verses 4 to 7. I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after have nothing more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he is killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, for you are more value than many sparrows. So Jesus wants to remind his disciples here that the absolute worst thing a crowd can do to you is to kill you. I mean, if you don't follow their, their ways of thinking, if you don't merge with the crowd, the worst thing they can do is kill you. I mean, that's the worst they can do. But he says, there's one thing that you should fear more than that. Fear the one who has the power of life and eternity. If you're going to fear something, fear him. And yet he also wants to remind his hearers that the same God that we should fear is the same God that can be trusted because he is a God that saves and provides and has compassion on those whom he loves. So at the end of the day, Jesus says, but if you're putting your hope and your trust in God, you don't even need to fear. Fear not. So don't be afraid of the crowds that you side with what they're saying just because they're a big crowd. 
Whose approval do I want? Do I want the crowd's approval or do I want God's approval? So continuing on in verse 14. About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, How is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. So after all this judging that Jesus is witnessing, he figures, okay, these guys have no clue. It's time to do some teaching. Teaching is good. Jesus says, I'm going to teach these guys some things because they're not listening. They're not understanding. They're not seeing. Maybe if I teach, their opinion will change because the opinions right now are based on speculation. They're based on popular opinion. They're not based on the truth and on reality. But right away, as soon as he starts teaching, they're making another judgment. They're using another method of judging that we're seeing isn't necessarily the best way. Because they say, let's judge him based on his credentials. It says, how is it this man has learning when he has never studied? So they look at Jesus and they go, I don't see his seminary transcript. I bet he hasn't even been to Bible school. Where's his MDiv? Where's his PhD? How can we even trust this guy? Now, sometimes it's really easy for us to judge people based on human credentials. We'll look to see what have they written and how many letters do they have behind their name? What school did they go to? I bet if they went to a great school, I'm going to put all my eggs in their basket. There's someone to listen to. But Jesus tells them, my teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. So Jesus is trying to tell them, it's not about the credentials. Listen to what I'm saying. It's not necessarily about what school I've gone to, what education I have, but what are the words that are coming out of my mouth? Where does that come from? Has it come from God? Is what I'm saying true? This is what Jesus wants us to think about. Now, these are things that we as a church really need to be careful with when we judge teachers, writers, pastors, preachers, for example. We need to think, am I trusting them solely based on credentials? Or am I trusting them based on what they actually say? So when we pick up a book, we need to look at it not from the perspective of, well, did they go to a really good school? Did they have a good degree? Are there people with degrees and people from highly educated places that are vouching for these people? Or do we look at the content of what they say and, and go, is this true? Where are they getting the wisdom they are spreading? And even more so, if they claim to be Christian and, and they claim to be speaking from a Christian perspective, does what they say line up with the character of Jesus? Does it line up with God's word? Where are they getting this wisdom? Is it just worldly wisdom? Or is it wisdom from God, from his word? It's not wise to trust someone just because they do or don't have a degree or set of worldly credentials. See, I know guys with and without seminary degrees who love Jesus, who love the scriptures, and they teach true and right doctrine. But I also know guys with and without seminary degrees who teach, but their teaching is false. It's not based on the scriptures, and it's, in fact, oftentimes opposed to what's in the scriptures. They claim to speak for God, but then they teach contrary to what Jesus taught, contrary to what Jesus has revealed about himself, his character, and what, what he actually did. And they do all this with a degree, with credentials. See, you can't judge purely based on credentials. It's not enough. It's not a bad place to start, maybe, but it's a horrible place to put your trust in. See, most of Jesus' disciples, they had no formal ministry training. But these are the people Jesus trusted to continue his mission and to build his church upon. A ragtag group of guys that Jesus spent time with. See, right judgment in this area means looking at people's words, looking at the content of what they say. Where are they getting what they say? Not necessarily what are their credentials from a worldly standpoint. Not necessarily what's on their educational resume. So Jesus continues in verse 17. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. But the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. So there's two things I want us to notice. And the first thing that I think is actually really interesting, in verse 17, he starts out saying, if anyone's will is to do God's will, 
then he'll know if the teaching is from God. So we need to have this desire to obey God to begin with, to know if what people are saying is true. This is what Jesus is saying. If we want to be able to tell if someone is speaking on their own authority or by God's authority, there needs to be this desire in us to actually want to obey God. Because really, if you think about it, if my desire is to rebel against God, I'm going to gravitate towards someone who doesn't give a rip about what God says. That's going to be my gravitation. It doesn't matter the credentials, it doesn't matter. But if someone's telling me what I want to hear, I'm going to gravitate towards that teaching. But Jesus is saying here, a desire for obedience is going to lead to right judgment, right judging. And those who are willing to follow Jesus, they're going to be intellectually convinced that what he is saying is true. That he really is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by him. They're going to be able to see that if they have the desire to obey God. And the second thing I want us to see is they'll be able to see that Jesus seeks the glory of God. It's Jesus who speaks on God's authority. Now, others who speak on their own authority, they're going to seek their own glory. They're going to want to make much of themselves, much of people. But the one who seeks the glory of God, this is true. This person is true. And in this instance, Jesus is the true one. He is the one who perfectly seeks the glory of God. I know for Christians, this is really hard because right now we live in this time and space where the kingdom has come, but it's not yet fully come. And so we live where there's things we want to do that we don't do, and there's things we don't want to do that we still do. And so we get this mixed bag in our own hearts where we want to give God the glory, but sometimes we want our own glory as well. I know Mark and I, we really try to make much of Jesus, who is God in the flesh. We realize he is the one to make much of. We want to give him the glory, and we want to be good teachers. We want to make much of God rather than making much of ourselves. But even in as much as we try to do that, we're going to fail. We're still sinners. We still mess up. And there's going to be times when, even unintentionally, we're seeking our own glory rather than the glory of God. We don't want to do that. We want to give God all the glory, but it's going to happen. All of us do this. As much as we want to give God the glory, there's going to be times and and spaces and even percentages of our good motivations where we still want ourselves to be made much of. So as you judge and as you observe, if you're a Christian... Or if you're in the process of trying to figure out who Jesus is. As you're trying to figure out, which church do I plug into to learn about Jesus? There's a few things I want you to ask yourself. Do the people who are preaching, who are praying, who are part of this church, do they make much of God or do they make much of man? What's the focus? Is the focus Jesus Or is the focus me? Is it God's grace? Or is it my effort? Is it Jesus' work for sinners? Or is it the inherent goodness of mankind? What's the focus of the people you're spending time with? If you want to learn about Jesus, if you want to rejoice in Jesus, if you want to discover who he is, Jesus is saying, find somewhere where Jesus is made much of. You're not going to learn much about Jesus if it's us being made much of. That's a false teacher, and Jesus tells us this is how we judge that. So Jesus teaches us to judge rightly in this and and to trust where God is made much of. And, And obviously, we want to do that as part of Grace Fellowship. Even as we fail, we want to make much of Jesus. And by God's grace, we hope that we do. Now, likewise, this is why we trust the Scriptures. Because the Scriptures make much of Jesus. And in Jesus talking about the scriptures and saying the scriptures are all about him, we recognize that this book, it makes much of God. If you've been doing the the Bible reading plan with us where we're trying to get through the Bible in a year, you'll notice that the stuff it says about people is not great. Like there's not a lot of good things that we see about people. But God is great. God is merciful. God is just. He is righteous. And he's gracious. And so rightly, we would think, okay, if we want to judge, let's judge based on the Bible. Let's judge based on the scriptures. Let's see what it has to say. And then we can base our judgments off that. 
But even in that, because our hearts are wicked, Jesus is going to say there's a right way, but there's also a wrong way to judge based on the Bible. So let's read verses 19 to 23. Jesus says, Has not Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? And the crowd answered, You have a demon. Who's seeking to kill you? So Jesus answered them, I did one work, and you all marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? So Jesus is talking about the Old Testament scriptures. He says the law. He's talking about the Pentateuch, or the first five books of the Bible. This is often referred to as the law of Moses. Now, Jesus said they're so worried about others following the law that they forgot to see what God was trying to do through it. It was given to the Israelite nation, and yet they didn't see why it was given. They just saw it as, here's some rules to follow. If you don't do it, you're bad. See, Jesus remarks about the healing he did, that he healed a man on the Sabbath. He was unable to move, and we saw this back when we were in John chapter 5. And Jesus makes this man well, and he says, get up, take your bed, and walk. Now, most of us might go, well, what's the big deal? It's just, so he said to do this on the Sabbath. By the way, when you see the word Sabbath, it was a Saturday. That was the seventh day of the week. And in the Sabbath, it was this understanding that God had commanded the Israelite nation to take a rest, to have a day to stop thinking about yourself, put your focus back on God, to realize that you were not in control, that God was in control and you weren't. So the way they observed this is by ceasing from work, by ceasing to do things. And so they had all these different things that they thought, well, this is work. I can't walk with a bed in my hand. I can't walk with a mattress in my hand. That's work. That's, I can't do that. And in fact, if you read through the Pentateuch, you might have seen that there were times that people were struck down by God's authority for picking up sticks on the Sabbath. So it wasn't like they were necessarily misinterpreting what it said. But at the same time, Jesus points out to them that when a different law, like the law of circumcision, conflicted with the Sabbath, they were all too happy to disregard the Sabbath in order for them to obey that other law, which in this case, he's talking about the law of circumcision, with which on the eighth day after a child was born, if it was a boy, he would go in to be circumcised as a picture that was given to the Old Testament nation of Israel. And Jesus was trying to tell them, even though they thought they were judging rightly about how to use the scriptures, how to apply them, how to obey them, because they thought that they were obeying what it said in the Bible, they actually had no clue. They weren't obeying. They were reading the Bible with the wrong lens. So in the end, they weren't actually obeying God's command because they were so worried about how it looked by appearances of what Jesus was doing on the Sabbath. They totally missed out that Jesus was making a man whole again, that he was healing someone who was broken, that he was bringing the curse of sin to the kingdom of God and removing it from him. They missed it. Jesus wanted them to see that God's intent for the rules of the nation of Israel were to set them apart as a nation so that other nations could see the character of God. They were supposed to see that God is holy, that God is righteous, that God is just, and Israel had that part figured out pretty good. But they were all supposed to show that God is merciful, compassionate, and forgiving. They focused purely on the former, and they neglected the latter. Because sometimes when we judge, it's easier to judge harshly than it is to judge with compassion. But if we are judging rightly using the scriptures, we need to understand that the Bible is not a rule book teaching us how to give a look, live a good life. It has rules in it, yes, but that's not what it's primarily about. It's the story of God and how he was willing to love 
an unholy, unrighteous, sinful, and rebellious people. This God who is pure, who is holy, who does not stand sin in his presence, was willing to love this nation of Israel who continued to rebel against him. So he poured out mercy and grace not only to an undeserving people, but an ill-deserving people who continued to run from him. And he continued to pour out mercy and grace so far that he was willing to send his own son to take the punishment that sinners like you and I deserved. Because we've traded the glory of God for the foolishness of the glory of man. It's useless for what we've done. Now, if we understand where we fit in this great story, the fact that God loves a people, that God has mercy on a people, that God is gracious to a people, that he has saved a people for himself and for his glory, then yes, we will see that there are commands given to us. There are things that we do. There are things that change our lives. It means we're going to think differently about money and sex and work and all of life. It means we act differently. It means we love differently. It means we live differently because of who God is. But if we're reading the Bible with a lens based on here's the things you must do to obey God, you're missing out. So we do want to judge based on what it says in the Bible. But we have to judge based on God's intent of Scripture. And this is why we think it's so important to read things in context. Not just taking out a verse here and a verse there and applying it to people we don't like. Or maybe even applying it to ourselves without understanding the character of God. Now Jesus concludes in verse 24, Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Just as we brought out in the beginning. He wants to remind them again that there's right judgment and there's wrong judgment. There's a way to look at the world where you're seeing it properly, and then there's a way to look at the world where you're missing the boat. You're making wrong judgments. But he doesn't say you won't judge or you shouldn't judge. Because you will judge. You're going to make opinions. You're going to have thoughts. You're going to draw to come to conclusions. But Jesus wants us to not judge based on popular opinion, based on appearances, based on credentials. But he wants us to judge based on whether people are making much of God. Is what they say true? Are they rightly interpreting what they say based on what the scripture says about who Jesus is, what he's done? And do we see the character of God as revealed in the scriptures? But I think more important than knowing how to judge one another, how to judge circumstances, how to judge the things we see in our society, this whole section is really about asking us, how do we look at Jesus? How are we judging Jesus? He's teaching us not only how to judge life, but he wants us to know, how do we form our opinions about God? How do we form our opinions about Jesus himself? So how do we judge the man who claimed to be God? How do we judge the one who is said to come back one day for the ultimate and final judgment? Here's the amazing part about this. For those who believe and trust in Jesus, we trust that he is who he says he is. We're told that the righteous one who can perfectly judge, he can see every single motive in our heart. Even though he is going to judge us, and even though we deserve condemnation because we know we don't fit the perfect mold God said we're supposed to fit, we're going to receive the judgment he deserves. The judgment that was deserved for sinners was given to him so we could receive the judgment that he deserves, which is the faithful son of God. That's crazy. That's gracious. That's miraculous. Because he's, in this moment in time where we're reading, he's going to be going to the cross to pay for the penalty that we have brought ourselves into by our sin, by our rebellion, by our rejection of God. And he's doing that so we could be brought into God's family. Jesus was punished for our rebellion, not his. He was punished for our sin, not his. 
And we saw this back in chapter 5 of John's gospel. It says this in verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. How do we think about this God who says this? How do we judge him who's giving up his judgment of us so that we can be brought into his family? He's taking the judgment we deserve on himself. Now from this whole book of John, everything John is writing is to get us to see who Jesus is, what he's done, so that we can make an accurate judgment. We see how Jesus related to people, what he did, how he perfectly exemplified the character of God in human flesh. He was God incarnate. We see this in scriptures. And we need to ask ourselves, how are we judging Jesus? Are we judging based on appearances, based on popular opinion, based on his credentials? Or are we judging based on the truth of who he said he is? The truth of what he's done? The truth of those who knew him best and how they relate the information to those who now get to see taste and experience the glory, the grace, and the goodness of God. So Father, I just ask that you would allow us to see Jesus with the eyes you want us to see him in. Help us to experience judging Jesus rightly, where we look at him knowing that he fulfilled everything we were supposed to do. And that even though we judge wrongly most of the time about things, he never does. And even still, even though we deserve such a harsh judgment that, Jesus, you were willing to give that, give us your kingdom because you were willing to pay the sacrifice for us. Thank you for your love and your patience, your goodness and your kindness. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.